Um, and we'll have award winners presenting about their teaching, their concept of teaching, what they've tried, what has worked for them. So we have the first one, Suzanne Presta from Engineering, who's presenting on exploring examples. And we're welcoming her and happy to have her present. Thanks. So I'm going to use the microphone because we're videotaping. So I'm maybe going to move around a little bit less than normally, but we'll see if Lily can follow me. I'll just see how things go. So Lily, if you would just give me a, a signal that things are going badly, then I'll be more static because normally I'm all over the place. Okay? So um, this is a new series that we're that we are going to run, thanks to CTL, of people that have won teaching awards on campus. And the objective is to share some of the very practical perspectives of people that have some experience. But we're integrating those with some of the expertise from a more theoretical level, from a more research-based level, from the Center for Teaching and Learning, so that we can help everybody get smarter faster. So that's the goal. My context is from the Faculty of Engineering, and one of the dominant characteristics of engineering graduates is that they are advanced problem solvers. And these are complex puzzle problems. You have to put a lot of pieces together to get from the beginning to the end. It's not like a high school word problem. No, you actually have to put a lot of pieces together to get from A to B. So mastery of the material is really important, but the content of the courses doesn't change very much. So in some faculties, you would like to reinvent your course notes almost annually because creativity and interpretation is a big part of the story. No, for us, clarity and accuracy is a big part of the story. And some of the concepts are pretty complicated. So once you get an example that works, you want to keep that one. Um, so these are some characteristics of what I think makes a great example. It has to have a compelling story, and that compelling story has to be very closely tied to the learning objectives in the course. So we can tell lots of stories in class, but if they don't line up with what we're trying to teach them, that's not as helpful. It needs to be a non-trivial problem. Because if you're trying to teach them what assumptions to make, but you don't illustrate how to choose those assumptions, then you've missed part of what they need to understand. Um, of course, the data and calculations should be correct. And the physics and the assumptions should be correct. And those look easy. When I presented this at UBC two weeks ago in a longer workshop format, um, the senior people in the room all laughed when I put that up. Because that is not quite as easy as it first looks. You can go into examples that you've used three or four times and a student asks a question and you go, I never thought of it that way. You're absolutely right. Let's change that, okay? So you have to keep revisiting that. Results should be representative of the real world. And that is, there are lots of classic academic problems that are very, very lovely and elegant from a theoretical perspective, but actually have a flaw when it comes to, would you really do this? And we'd like to complete it in one class. I'll talk later about how to do that for some of these big problems, because you don't always have the time to go through the whole example on board. So there's some mechanics you can play with, too. Um, three points of context and theory. Examples engage the students in understanding. If you want to get them talking to you and having a conversation in class, getting an example going will produce that back and forth faster than anything else. Students learn differently than professors. And it's not so easy to apply concepts to new problems. So let's dig into that a little bit more carefully. Active learning works. So this is um, a Nobel Prize winner actually decided he should get some data on his teaching. And to his horror, he found out that his first year physics students knew less when they left the room than when they came in. So that was quite, quite alarming. 
And that led to a whole area of investigation on common misconceptions, it's called. And then they've done catalogs of key concepts and tags that tell you if those are working. Then they designed active learning exercises around examples to walk through students through some of those things. One example is if I want to cool off my kitchen on a hot summer's day and I open the refrigerator door, will that work? Oh, that's kind of a cool idea. And you talk to a neighbor and you work through that and you go, uh, the efficiency of the refrigerator is actually pretty crappy, so you're going to heat up your room pretty quick, right? You'll blow cold air out of the fridge, but the motor is going to generate way more heat because you're not in a perpetual motion machine mode. So things like that help students break through preconceptions and do much better, so you get 80% learning instead of 20%. So just as we talk about some of these things, how many of your favorite professors inserted examples into their lectures to illustrate what was going on? Now students, there's a, there's a, a learning styles inventory that's fairly standard across engineering education circles called the Felder Silverman Learning Styles Inventory. And across uh, 100 new professors and over 1,000 students in engineering. I've used this over 20 years. Uh, we are quite similar on a number of dimensions. So the visual verbal scale, everybody prefers to get visual information. That makes a big impact. Our students tend to be active because they want to solve problems and be in motion. They like data. They're not so much about intuitive concepts. But there's a big match on the sequential to global scale. So the students like to build things up in pieces, but professors want to see the big picture and work down. So we want to have F equals MA and apply it to 18 different kinds of problems. And if you give us F equals MA, we have the belief that we are, we are able to do that. But if you ask students to do that, they will be completely lost and they need to work their way up from examples. So the examples give us a way to speak to students sequentially so that they can get a handle on what we're on about. Now, in the bigger field of educational literature, Genevieve and I had a conversation last week and she says, oh, what you're describing is actually the novice learner versus the expert. Because the expert has a context to put things into a place where they fit, and they've already done their construction of knowledge. Whereas the student has no context, they're trying to build it up from zero, and they need to have a link. They're, they're trying to build up how these things fit together. So from where they're sitting, it's quite a different view of the world. And when we go to a brand new area, so when I teach new professors about Bloom's cognitive levels, they go, ah, I don't understand anything. Could you give me an example? Because suddenly they're novice learners again. And so I think that construction is quite useful. Now, this third piece is from a plenary lecture that I got to hear at a Gordon conference on visualization in education. And this guy was doing the cognitive development in problem solving. And he was able to take it apart and say, look, we have to go through a number of steps here. So we start with math skills. And they only have to deal with x, y, and z variables and the procedural skills in the map. Then we have a translation map, where instead of x's, y's, and z's, we have apples and oranges and distances and airplanes. And just, you know, where will they meet on the road? And so the translation of variables from physical space to x, y, z space is the first place where the cognitive shift is kind of big. A lot of people get lost there. Then we take them and we say, okay, use one skill to solve one problem. So when you do your first statics course, we say the sum of the forces is zero, and that way the, the bridge doesn't fall down. 
But all the problems are about the sum of forces equal zero. Then they go into dynamics. And we say, you've got three or four equations to pick from, and you've got eight different kinds of problems to solve. So by the final exam, you have to be able to figure out which tool to use for which problem. Um, now, I think most of the people in the room have probably been up to that level. But as we go through the next steps, notice where you maybe first hit that approach. So now, we have to pick the right tool for a problem with a new twist. So maybe we're doing heat transfer, but we have to figure out if it's conduction or convection, and we have to pick from a set of boundary conditions, and the story's a little different than we expected. Then, we get a little bit further in the program, and we say, aha, we're going to give you a new problem, and you have to figure out what tools to use to solve it. So the capstone design course, we give them a one-page description, and they have four months to work on the problem and come up with a plant design, like a chemical plant, not a flower. <laughs> OK. And then, given a new problem with lots of different facets, now you have to use all your courses and all your background, and you're going to create something new. So we get into that in graduate school. Okay. So every step along the way, the problems get a little harder, and the examples get a little harder. And when we're at step number five, picking the right tool for a new problem, it actually takes learners at least three times through a guided example before they can correctly choose the path for themselves. So when the students say, we need more examples, they're not making it up. <laughs> They're not making it up. They actually don't have their pathways securely enough in place to figure it out. Concept maps help a lot. So I actually use concept maps as one of my examples in my second year course. But this is why I think examples are so very, very important. So I want to just pause there and see if we've got any burning questions before I dig into the guts of the thing I want to share with you. All right, so in our fluid mechanics course, we have something called linear momentum. And when I was taught linear momentum, I thought it was a crock. I'll be straight up with you. I do research in fluid mechanics. I love fluid mechanics. It's my favorite thing ever. I thought linear momentum was a crock. I thought it had no credibility. I thought it was silly. Now, what do we actually want them to know? Because then I had to turn around and teach this, you know, and it's got no street cred with me. But never mind. So the first learning objective is that we want them to know that changing the direction of flow of a fluid requires application of a force. It's that F equals M A thing again. A body in motion remains in motion at the same rate of speed in the same direction unless you apply a force. What does momentum mean? We want them to understand that. We would like them also to select coordinates and decompose the vector equation into components. As soon as you tell undergraduates they're going to solve the vector equation, they freak out. OK? I guarantee you, there's a lot of freaking out happening in the room. You might not want to start there. What assumptions are needed to complete the problem solution, and are they reasonable? So this is one that's going to show up for a lot of people in the room. So you know, we talked about, was linear momentum going to be too technical? And I said, actually, a lot of the teaching workshops I've been to that have been the most useful to me have been the ones where the instructor said, I'm really sorry, but I want to show you the hard bits. And the only way I can do that is to take an example that I'm really familiar with, because Otherwise, I can't illustrate it. So just let go a little bit of the details and try to take the meta level. So I, one of the things I said in the abstract is bring your own difficult concept. What do you have a hard time explaining? 
and hold that as we're going through this one and see if you notice anything useful. Okay, so what is it that gets in the way? Number one is motivation. All right. Number two, the vector equations thing. It's the first time they have to actually solve a vector equation outside of statics and dynamics. The gut feeling for linear momentum of a fluid, the assumptions are often counterintuitive, at least the way I was taught. Okay? And the results can be counterintuitive. Hmm. So, once we get a catalog of the barriers, then we can start to design an example. So, keeping in mind again, your own difficult concept. Um, I want to get it out of here on time. I want to go through the pieces. So, I would like you just in your own head to identify at least one cognitive barrier in your own difficult concept. Where is it that you think the students get stuck? All right. And you can write that down if you want, or you can just hold it in your head if you want. The silence is really hard to take. Watch for people's pencil motions. Okay, if there are people writing, they're engaged. And some people won't write, that's fine. Okay, so this is, this is the old way of introducing it. The firefighter aims a hose at a trash can lit target and a stream of water is deflected. Now, my colleague, Bill Pegg, tells me that, well, he always thought this was a great example because he took it when they were having riots and they were, they were shooting fire hoses and the student protesters. So he thought this was a really good thing to know. And I'm like, oh, well, that makes more sense. Because I always thought, I'm not going to be a firefighter. I don't, what? what? <laughs> okay? So the idea is that the, the fire hose comes in this way and it gets deflected sideways. And what's the force on the lid? Okay? So I always thought this was kind of kooky because it doesn't spend enough time on the key concepts. Like, what? how do I pick the coordinate system? How do I pick the assumptions and validate them? Because, really, that's, that's actually pretty hard. And I also have to decompose the problem into three components. So we're going to have to have more than one example to get to the point where they can do this independently, okay? The conceptual development here the math on this problem is so easy, it's almost a joke. But the conceptual part is where we really want to get to. Now, I actually broke it down into two pieces. The first one I use is water from a faucet. Number one, if they brush their teeth, they're going to fall over it. If they put their hand under the faucet to feel how warm it is before they wash the dishes tonight, they are going to fall over it. They do not need a fire hose. Now, I look at them and I say, okay, if you hold your hand under the stream of water out of the faucet, is there a force on your hand? Yes. Ah, okay. So it's very sensory. It's very present. It's very easy to access. I don't do any numerical analysis with that one. I just use that to say, hey, if you change the direction, you apply a force. Full stop. Then I'm going to walk you through the second one that I use, which is the flame <coughs> plant explosion. Okay. Now, this one is going to have two directional components. There's an emotional impact. There's a bunch of other things that come into it. But check this out. Changing the direction of the fluid flow requires a force. Okay? And as soon as you think about the water hitting your hands, you feel that because it's part of your experience. There's one dimension. It's, it's more or less aligned with gravity. So the intuition is easier to get a hold of. But it doesn't really align with the trash can lid which is why I always objected to the trash can lid, because this is not coming out in a nice, clear, even stream. There's a lot of surface tension effects. There's a lot of instabilities. The thickness of the layer on your hands 
and on the trash can lid actually has a hydraulic jump in it and it's very, very complicated to analyze. Okay? So that example is so idealized that it's confusing. So we can point out the complications with trying to analyze this particular problem. Because it really doesn't look a whole lot like this picture. Okay? And that's where it gets, you, you have to really know and understand the subject area to untangle some of the subtleties in designing an example that's consistent with the theory. Okay, so there's some problems here. It, this is not too bad. This one, which is this pretend surface, is a little trickier. This one, um, I was skeptical as an undergraduate, and I was skeptical for good reason. Okay. Now here's our reactor train. So, what they had is they had a situation where they needed to bypass this reactor here, number five out of six. So they put in a bypass pipe with flexible bellows on either end. It turns out they didn't have a mechanical engineer on the crew at the time, so the design was not stamped. And professionalism is one of our values, so I make a point of sharing that with them. The design did not consider the forces due to momentum or due to pressure fluctuations. Um, it didn't work. <coughs> the plant blew up. The fires burned for 11 days, 10 days. 28 people were killed, including all 18 in the control room. 36 people went to the hospital. It flattened 1,800 houses and 160 shops and factories in surrounding villages. So this was in northern England, and the, the density of land use there is very, very high. So you see these things closer than, than we would ideally like here. So, uh, what's right about this example? Well, I'll start at the bottom. The affect of domain lessons in safety, professionalism, and scope of practice are very it takes a couple of minutes to get the class back to interested in momentum. The vector formulation is clearly going to be necessary because we're going around two corners. The context exactly matches their student learning goal. They want to be chemical engineers. They want to work in a process plant. They want to supervise those operators in that control room. So they want to win at this. So they want to be P-edges, right? In this particular example, the flow is contained in a pipe. So we don't have to worry about defining the surfaces. It's all contained flow. The viscous forces are negligible because the flow is turbulent. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, those of you that do momentum will understand that that's important. Now, what I'd like you to get out of this one is the construction of a visual story, okay? And the repetition of the example. So this is a diagram of the actual pipe. And there's a pressure force going in and a reaction pressure force going backwards. And those two are not aligned. There's actually a moment due to those because we change elevation. Then, this is the point where I introduce the momentum equation, and then on the board, we break it down into the three components. On the board. The board is the place to go at the level where they're learning, so if you need to slow down for a minute, try to use the board or a tablet. Now, we're going to have three things. We're going to have the initial vector, the deflected vector, and the deflection force, which is actually um, the mass flow rate. Okay, So it's kilograms per second. So we'll start here, and we need to correct that control volume to be perpendicular to the flow. All right. 
And I don't mind having a couple of errors so that they can correct things because it helps them to think about it and it also gets them started on critically evaluating what I'm doing. There's the vector coming in. There's the vector going out. We're in black. So that's the deflection that I have to accomplish. Now let's reconstruct that above the figure. And there's the force that's applied to the joint in blue. Okay. So that force is acting up on the joint. Then we're going to come down to the second one. And as professors, we would think that, okay, we've shown them once, the next one is obvious. No, it's actually really, really valuable to them for us to repeat it because they only got 50% of it the first time because they were frantically trying to write down all the pieces. So repeating it a second time is really valuable. And there's something cool going to come out of it. Okay, now everybody in the room realizes that this control volume needs to be modified. There's our vector coming in. There it is going out. Now I'm going to pull it down here and reconstruct the force this time is acting down. So is there a rotational force on that joint? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And what's that going to do? That's going to torque that joint. Is it acting in the same direction as the torque due to the pressure forces? Yeah, it is. They're both turning it this way. Okay. And what happened is they had a pressure surge that increased the dynamic pressure force. And so under normal conditions, it was doing okay. But this dynamic thing completely threw it off the rails. All right. But notice what happens when you use the color. Notice what happens when you reconstruct it. And notice what happens when you go through it twice and build it up one step at a time. So now they've got a sense that there's something grounded and intuitively sensible about this problem. And it might be kind of useful to get forces on joints. Okay. Now, I continue through the course and we have a bunch more examples that show different combinations of forces and deflections. Their assignment problem combines several ideas and gets them one step further. So now they have to define the coordinate system or the control volume, one at a time. Okay, that's the next step in, oh, there was a mistake in my control volume. So we have to look for the characteristics normal to the fluid flow, okay, hanging out across the solid boundaries so we can get the forces and so on. When I first taught it, they completely failed the final exam question on momentum because I didn't understand how to teach it yet, okay. By the end of three or four iterations, I could give them a new problem. So one of the ones I liked was a sandblaster. So now it's actually back to the trash can lid. That's exactly the trash can lid, only it's horizontal. And they were able to pick. I didn't make them do both. They could either define the boundaries on the control volume and explain why they put them where they put them, or they could pick the correct assumptions to apply given a control volume. So the two of those go hand in hand. And I didn't ever ask them to do both, but they could successfully complete one given the other. And it didn't matter which one I picked. Then they have to do the calculations and find the force. So what's the lesson plan? First, there's a tactile example. That's example number one. Then there's a compelling industrial example of fluid forces that we actually decompose. That's really example number two, but we'll call it number one. Present the momentum equation in its general integral form and decompose it into three simplified components. So it's not until they're motivated and know where they're going with this that I take them back to the really fundamental equation. Then apply it to problem number two of pipe elbow. 
So now instead of going at this angle twice, we're going to go at 90 degrees. So they get some reinforcement and put in numbers. Then there's a lovely one in the seminar that's a go devil um, that's used for resuspending a pulp chest that's gotten all jammed up. So you put it in, it fluidizes, only the way it's set up, the way the thing works, is if this thing is on the end of a hose, and if it escapes from the pulp chest, it takes off across the room. So I actually got the story from an operator who had been chased by a go devil. He says, oh yeah, if you get chased by one of those, you go like a devil, because it is crazy and insane. And so the story that goes with it is fun, but the analysis is pretty complicated. And so you do the analysis inside the stock chest, and then you do it outside the stock chest, and they get a better understanding of how they define all the pieces. So that's fun. Now, this is key. The seminar comes after the lectures, and at least three days before they have to hand in their assignment. So as a, a new instructor, one of, the, one of the things that can happen is you get these things backwards, so their assignment is due before they got the lectures, and they get the seminar two weeks later. Setting that up is really tricky, and it takes a spreadsheet and two hours at the beginning of the term every single time that I have to do it. And then sometimes you go sideways and you have to modify things. So getting that all lined up is really important. And then in the assignment, they reinforce all the things in the other examples by doing it themselves. Uh, they get a modified example, a snowmaking wand for a ski hill, again, something they've seen and care about. Um, a textbook example. They have last year's assignments and solutions available to them, so that multiplies what they've got available by quite a bit. And then we have the final exam. You have to test what you taught. If you test something you didn't teach because you were feeling creative and happy and motivated and bored with the material and you wanted to do something new, guess what? They won't do very well. It's tragic. Okay? But if you don't test what you taught, you're going to get a bad result. So you can push them a little bit further up the scale, but you have to test what you taught. And it sounds obvious, but I can tell you I've made that mistake more than once myself couple of weeks ago, actually. <laughs> so, sad but true, it's actually pretty subtle. So, um, when we formulate learning objectives for these, so I just want to pause there, because we have a bit of time. So I'd like you to go back to your own difficult concept and explain it to somebody sitting next to you. And what it is about that that you think makes it difficult to teach. So now I'm not just about the students, I'm about what makes it difficult to teach. So I'll just give you less than five minutes to talk about that. Okay, probably three minutes. Absolutely. 
the, the things that we think they know that they don't know, that they don't even know how to get at, are sometimes enormous, particularly at the second and third year level. By the time they're fourth year students, they know what questions to ask when they get carried away, right? They don't know, but they know what questions to ask when we're getting too excited. Anybody else? Yeah. We can be a little bit uncomfortable with the concept ourselves. Yes. Yes. And one of the things, there was a beautiful study, meta-study done of not just teaching award winners, but awesome, amazing teaching award winners, and across a bunch of US schools. And one of the things they found was that the people that were awesome, amazing teaching award winners actually had a very, very deep understanding of the subject, right down to the boots. Right? And that takes some time to get to because I learn a lot from my students. They help me deconstruct knowledge. Right? And I impose my ignorance on them on a regular basis. It's it's those are those are humility days, right? I don't know how to explain this to you. Can you help me out with where I'm stuck? Okay? They want to learn though, they'll tell you. And they're they're very kind about it. They're very kind about it because they're very committed to getting to the solution. So it's it's very interesting. Anybody else? Um, I uh, have trouble with uh, preconceived ideas that some of the students come up with. Like they've got a package of ideas that they already have in their head. It's true. Uh, you don't know what they have. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. They have out. And they're very attached to them. They're very attached. Water always boils at 100 degrees, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. High pressure steam can be at like 350 degrees C. Mine was uh, the one student came up and asked me and said, well, I thought only criminals had DNA. <laughs> <laughs> That's fabulous. Yeah. That's just fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Forensic TV shows like right. that. Right. Only criminals have DNA. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Right. <laughs> when it turns on, as soon as you come in the car. <laughs> So I'd like to move on. Now we're going to get to something a little bit more formal. How do you formulate learning objectives for problem solving? And learning objectives is a really challenging thing for new folks to learn. And it's kind of like, uh, you know, in engineering, I can say the Navier-Stokes equations. It's that first law of the running out. If you can get this, you can do an awful lot with it, but it's really hard to get it from the beginning. So let's try to break that down a bit. Start with the content, identify a specific action, put it in the context of at what level do you want them to be able to do this, um, and then use those objectives as a tool to focus your teaching and align, you got to align lectures, examples, assignments, and exams. So if you don't have a compass in a really clear direction, it's really hard to get that right. But you might not know the learning objectives the first time you teach the course because you don't you were taught perfectly, so you have an imperfect understanding of the ideas. So this was my first pass at the learning objective for momentum balances, which I showed at the beginning of it. I want to understand, I want to know that changing the direction of motion requires a force. I want you to be able to explain what the momentum of a fluid means using an example. What I want you to be able to do is to pick a coordinate system and decompose the problem into components. Now that's actually quite tricky because we want them to analyze, apply, and synthesize and those of you that have played with Bloom's hierarchy know that those are all pretty high level objectives. Okay? And the problem keeps changing, and the boundaries keep changing, and the direction of the force keeps changing. This is not a simple problem. Then we need to pick some assumptions. Now, what I do is I say these are the standard assumptions. There's a list of four that will almost always solve your problems, but you have to know when to pick which one. They're not magic, they're standard assumptions. They don't come out of the sky because I'm a genius and you're a lonely student. 
No, I'm actually taking from four standard ones. No, this is an alternate one, which we actually worked out as a result of another version of this workshop. So, this is what we came away with. You will be able to confidently, because it's very important to me that they've developed enough expertise to be confident in their analysis, not just shaky about it. And if they know that I want them to be confident about it, they will actually ask me more questions. Okay? So I'm willing to take them to the next level. I want them to be able to calculate forces on surfaces due to linear momentum. The solution can include all of the following steps or some selection among them. So you say, we're going to have a whole bunch of different solutions. You're going to have this set of tools and you have to figure out which ones to use in a given situation. That's actually the core of what we're after in engineering problem solving. And that is, is a bit of an unusual example of a learning objective. So we've been playing with this for quite a while, trying to find a way to formulate it. Okay? So this is actually brand new. Um, but I think that it's going to give us some openings to actually make progress instead of having long lists of hundreds of things, which is... Uh, I really have to read those. Um, this this covers off a whole um, host of possibilities. Now, coming back to your problem, can you reframe your problem as a learning objective? What is one piece, just one little piece of the story that you would like to be able to capture, thinking back to what it is that's difficult to explain? What is the positive goal? So now reframe it as what do you want me to be able to do? Okay, 
Now, it's hard to write learning objectives, so I wanted to throw you a lifeline. So here's a series of questions that can help you organize your thinking. What's the broad topic that you're trying to think about? Mine was momentum balances on a fluid. All right? That's the section in the course, the module, the topic, the chapter in the book. What's the application? So if you're teaching using examples, you usually have an application for the concept. What kinds of problems do you want them to be able to solve? What's the bigger goal? What type of problem are you going to solve? What type of problem are you going to solve? And that can be different depending on the level of the course. So in our first material balances course, we're solving macro scale material balances on whole pieces of equipment, on block flow diagrams. When they get into their distillation course, they're integrating thermodynamics, <coughs> stage-wise material balances, and energy balances to solve a whole distillation column with the details of everything that happens in the middle, including non-ideal thermodynamics. So that's a completely different um, manifestation of material balances than the first one we picked. And you need to be clear on what level you're tackling before you can do a great exam. And then what are the components of a complete solution? So if you can answer those things, you're well underway to knowing what you have to have to construct a good exam question, a good midterm question, a good example, and a great lecture. Because it helps you deconstruct your own tacit knowledge, especially the last one. Okay. Once you can figure out where the stuck points are, which is what we've been trying to move you towards at intervals today, then it's a lot easier to know where to focus your class time because that's where they're getting the most learning. There's the, the math, I don't spend much time on the math, to be honest. They already got the math skills. I'm much more interested in their other skills. Okay, I promised you some mechanics and time. We kind of did questions as we went along. I recommend posting your examples on the course website. I use 30% of my lecture time on examples. Doing a simple example on the board is a good thing. Commentary is a great thing. Thought bubbles they love. Why did I do this? Where did that come from? What do you need to notice here? This is an important assumption. Um, be sure to write it down on the board so it's captured. Lots of our students have processing problems either due to language or decoding of words or decoding of numbers or decoding of your really bad handwriting or your voice that doesn't carry in the back of the room. So help yourself out and help them out. Write it down, post it. Um, stop to reflect on the difficult points. If you put the lid on your marker and you take three steps away from the board and you look back on it to check your work, oh, you just sent an affective domain message that it's important to check your work and you focus their attention on what the heck was going on instead of scrambling to write it all down, and now you've got their attention, you can actually make a good point. So there's a little bit of theatrics that goes into it. Um, if there's noise in the room, that's a good thing. It doesn't mean they've gone to the pub early. It means that they're talking about the example of trying to understand what you did. So it's a signal to stop and listen and get feedback and information, okay? Once in a while, they do go to the pub early. <laughs> All right? That's a different sound. <laughs> I promise you, it has a different frequency. It's, it's happier and it's higher pitched. You'll pick it up. <laughs> OK? I promise you'll pick it up. And there's no pencils moving when that happens. There's a lot of pointing fingers when they're confused. OK? And usually, you may not. Me, you can't see the whole board when you're up there. Usually me, I made a mistake on board, and they're going to mail me out. So I really like to listen to you. 
Um, start slow and build trust when you're engaging them in solutions. Pick key steps for them to reflect on what you're doing and give them a bit of time to do it. Uh, think care share is really powerful. When I asked you to share with a neighbor, how many people talked? Everybody in the room talked, because I watched. There were lots of lips moving. How many people volunteered to share? Four, okay, roughly. Okay, so we had 100% engagement, and then we had a small level of exciting engagement. Both of those are good. You can go around the room and pick on everybody if you think they're not engaging. I've done that with professors. It works great. <laughs> so I can recommend that in a small group. This is also great once you get further in the course and you're getting into more complicated examples. If they get it, that they need to engage because they're going to get something out of it. It's called thinking aloud paired problem solving. It's great for long problems. You can get a two hour problem done in 50 minutes. You can have complicated discussion along the way. One example, work out the solution to a long problem, you do that. Then you hand out copies of it, the whole thing. You give it all away, you get them to, into pairs. For the first five minutes, student A explains the solution, and student B can only ask questions. They will put up their hand if they get stuck. You collect their questions, and after five minutes, you can regroup with the whole room and clarify those points. Then they trade places. Okay. Now they have had practice in explaining, which is another aspect of domain skill. They've had practice in questioning, which is a critical thinking, affective domain, higher level thinking skill. And they've gotten way further in the problem than you could have rewriting it on the board. And you keep doing that until they've gotten through the whole problem. You pause for group discussion. After five minutes, they trade roles, and it's great. They will find every single mistake in the problem, by the way. If you're worried about making mistakes and the student's going away confused, this is awesome. They'll find them all while they're all together. Then you can post the correct version. Nobody's the wiser. Okay, uh, so my main points. Examples are great. They're not trivial to design. I asked the students in my fourth year class um, to rate three things, uh, matching teaching styles to learning styles. 75% of them said that was either critical to their learning or extremely important to them. Aligning, get this one, listen to this carefully, alignment of learning objectives and cognitive levels between their notes, examples, assignments, and testing was important to them. They know what a learning objective is. They don't necessarily enunciate it, but they know that we tested them or gave them problems on things that were out of alignment. 85% of them, so bigger mileage than matching, visual learning, okay? Effective examples, 90%. 90%. So if you're going to invest time in your lectures, don't put them into beautiful PowerPoint slides. Give the students 30% examples. They'll help more. Okay? It's not so easy. Don't hesitate to publish a great example. You can publish them in refereed journals. It counts the same as a research paper in most faculties. Um, our colleagues in business call them case studies. They're huge. They're enormous. They're amazing. They make money on it. <laughs> Do that. Um, thank you. <laughs> so that was dense and packed, and I'm happy to take questions, but I'm also aware of the fact that we're at 3.30, so people have other commitments, and if you need to go, please feel free to do that. But anybody that has questions they want to pose now? Yeah. So when you're doing an example, and saying you probably feel, go through the whole solution, perhaps using a tablet or a or whatever. Um, so I guess you can post that later. Mm -hmm. um, I post them ahead of time because I use my examples many times. Oh, okay. So some of them will have gone through it ahead of time. 
okay? And they'll, or they, and they will come to you before the final exam and say, in the more detailed example you posted in the course notes, you did this other thing, and I didn't understand. Yeah, that's what I was finding, that disconnect with the, sometimes I think, oh, post lecture notes before or after, yeah. you know? Any time is good, and sooner <laughs> is better, Yeah, would be my comment. Yeah. Okay? Maybe after you can actually capture all that other really Attendance stuff. goes up when you post things ahead of time. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, yeah. Which is weird. Think it's counterintuitive, but it's true because it, I think it builds integrity and they, they get to decide. But it also maybe means that it's a correlation, not a causation. If you're organized enough to post it ahead of time and you think your notes are good enough to share with the public, maybe you're delivering better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it could be either way. Right. Thank you for coming. I hope it was useful. It was pretty dense. Um, I think we can post the slides. Do we have the capacity to do that? Because I would like people to have that resource. So um, we'll set it up. Post it along the video. Okay. So you can watch me again. <laughs> I, got, I have to tell you, the last time I got videotaped giving a lecture, I was pregnant, really, really pregnant with my first daughter who's now in third year of mechanical engineering. For years, I met people and they would look at me and say, I saw you give a lecture. And I said, was I really pregnant? Yeah! Because <laughs> it was posted on an internal website. So that was really funny. So I'm happy to be looking like myself today. <laughs> Thanks a lot.